It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Rita Zamora, who is an international speaker and published author on social media and online reputation management. She and her team have been helping dentists and specialists across the country with social media training and custom monthly management programs since 2007. Rita served as a contributing faculty member on the topic of marketing for the American Dental Association Center for Success Certificate Program. She graduated magnum cum laude from the University of Colorado with a bachelor's degree in business and marketing with over 20 years experience in the business of dentistry, working with general and specialty practices. She brings a solid understanding of the dental world to the table. And I want to, um, I want to show you, uh, I just retweeted. You can follow her on Twitter at Rita Zamora, a, an amazing dentist, Theodore J. Boris. I learned, he, uh, he attended her class at Chicago Midwinter, and he wrote, I learned more about the need for a social media plan in an hour than at any time previous. I hope you realize what a professional image you project on the stage. Compliments, compliments. So uh, uh, I just retweeted that, and they invited you to come back again 2019. So Rita, um, when I got out of school, it was the Yellow Pages. And I, in 1987, I took out a full page out of the Yellow Pages and it got me a free dinner from the executive director of the Arizona State Dental Association to take me to lunch and tell me how that was ruining the image of dentistry. And if I needed a bypass, would I take <laughs> someone out of the Yellow Pages? And this is a bad thing. And now, um, Yellow Pages have kind of been replaced by social media. Is there even a place less for yellow pages in rural farming areas or is it all dead everywhere oh gosh you know what i've learned howard is to never say never because then people get in touch with me and they're like but what about you know and so there is still a place i'm sure somewhere you know we've got little teeny tiny mountain towns here in Colorado where I'm based and they may not have access to Wi-Fi. They might be old school and just still using like their local, you know, yellow page book for whatever. But uh, for the most part, for mainstream, for the most part, not really. Yellow pages are, are done um, for the most part. So what's got you um, most excited about social media? What, 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 did, uh, what did you tell Theodore in an hour that he learned more than in his entire previous education? If someone said to you, mm -hmm. what's social media? Uh, because at the end of the day, dentists don't want social media. They want new patients. How does social media translate to me getting another patient to the door to do my craft? Yeah. Most importantly, it's that people can actually – get to know you and vet you and feel like, hey, this is really who Howard is. I trust you and I like you and I'm connecting with you in some way. And I think, you know, this is going to be the best fit for me. That's the number one reason to be using social media. But, but yeah, Rita, one of the problems we have is when you go to the store and buy uh, Folgers coffee or you go buy an iPhone you you know what it is but when you go to a mechanic or a dentist and he tells you um, you need to change your transmission or you have four cavities the consumer it's, it's all based on trust I mean how do I know I mean I grew up with five sisters and played Barbie dolls till I was 12 I, I don't know what a <laughs> transmission is I, I, I don't know any of that stuff so when that guy tells me I have to have a new transmission it's just blind, naked trust. And I'm sitting there thinking, that's what all my patients must feel like when I tell them they got four cavities. Right. Yeah. I mean, anybody who uses a smartphone knows that they can research anything, anytime, anywhere and get all sorts of information, you know. Um, and so why wouldn't they want to know as much as possible about who it is that's going to be this close to them and looking in their mouth and have them in this, you know, vulnerable position in their dental chair. So um, people might be intimidated or they might be scared or nervous or whatever, and that just helps them to feel like they get to know you and connect with you in some way. So it's super, super important. And especially um, with the millennial, you know, generation growing up there, it's not a non-negotiable. Like they want to know they're working with someone or paying someone for their dentistry that is authentic and hopefully, you know, would also be working towards a cause that they believe in, have something in common with them. And if you don't have that trust factor, it's, it's going to be, you know, very difficult to attract new patients. So how, how do you, how do you build trust? Uh, do, do you, 
you're, you're saying that social media should be building trust. Um, how, mm -hmm. how does a, a, a young dentist establish trust? Um, what, what are the keys to designing trust? Now, I know you spent years mm -hmm. working in a dental office presenting very big perio implant cases. Uh, so so you've, uh, you've been in the trenches uh, for a long time. How, how can a dentist be more trustworthy. Yeah, I learned a lot about trust. And yeah, I mean, being in the trenches, a lot of people don't know that I'm a dental person at heart still. I mean, one of my favorite jobs ever was doing case presentation for big perio and implant cases. And when you're looking at a patient face to face and telling them, you know, you need to have all of your teeth removed or some teeth removed, and here's the treatment plan, you know, to have the dental implant treatment done. And this was back, you know, probably, gosh, 10, 12 years ago when we were doing big dental implant cases. Patients were afraid and nervous and, you know, had all sorts of questions. And if they don't have a trust level with your practice, they're going to go somewhere else or they're not going to do it. So I really loved um, talking with patients about um, their treatment and working with them in that way. And that's really all social media is too. It's showing people who you are through photos or video or through the written word if you're into writing, you know, blogs or whatever, but letting people see who you are, who your team is um, in, in different formats that you're comfortable with and letting them see what you're all about, not just the type of dentistry that you offer and what you're really good at clinically, but also who you are as a person. And there's lots of different ways to do that, even if you're a really private person. Rita, when you say social media, um, what does that really mean? I mean, God, there's should it there's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat, Pinterest. What do you, what do you recommend a dentist? Should they be doing them all? Uh, mm -hmm. what, or what is the most um, effective to the least effective? Like if you could put those in order of getting new patients to come through the door, how would you line up that list? Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's almost I almost think of that as um, not really a trick question, but there's so many different right answers. So I'll give you the, the main the biggies are, of course, Facebook, um, Instagram. And then I would say those are the top, the big ones. And then the least effective, I would say, are Twitter, um, you know, unless you're some kind of a Twitter, you know, fanatic genius person that really loves it because that's a component. If you don't like the social media that you're using um, and you're the, the dentist or the social media manager for the practice, it's probably not going to do well for you. But for sure, the big ones are Facebook and Instagram. And then, you know, when you look at Twitter, it's not really going to benefit you. Um, LinkedIn is something that you could set up a platform um, a piece of online real estate, I call it. So set up a place card for yourself there. And you're probably going to get a lot of invitations from salespeople, but it's one more place to set up an online piece of real estate for yourself. And Snap, Snapchat's another one that, you know, we could talk about too. There's some doctors who love that and that might be beneficial for them. But for the mainstream, it's Facebook and Instagram. Well, I've noticed um, the stock in Twitter and Snapchat has lost over half of its value. Uh, mm -hmm. And do you think that's why? Because it's not as effective a marketing tool? Well, it's I we've used Twitter, you know, even back in the day, like, you know, when there weren't that many people using Twitter and you could use it to follow local people and see if they would reciprocate and that sort of thing. I mean, it just never really took off and you can't leave reviews there. Only until recently is Twitter really accommodating photos and video. So you never really had that aspect available there. Maybe that's part of why it didn't take off. And then Snapchat's really losing out to Instagram now that they're replicating a lot of their features and people I think are seeing from what I've read, you just a lot of ads on Snapchat and not feeling that same momentum, at least with the population that we're looking to attract into dental practices, you know, teenagers and younger kids, that might be a different story. Well, so, so you're basically, so the, so you're basically saying concentrate on Facebook and Instagram. 
for the most part. And we yes. like that because uh, Mark Zuckerberg's dad is a dentist, Ed Zuckerberg. So we, we yes. have a soft spot for uh, Facebook and Instagram. Instagram, they say, it was probably Mark's best investment idea ever. I mean, he bought that thing for a billion, and they said if they spun it off on its own today, it'd be uh, have a higher valuation than Snapchat. But so so what should a dentist do on Facebook and Instagram? What, what would you advise them to do? Mm -hmm. Well, looping back around to what um, Dr. Ted Boris of the Chicago Dental Society, the Chicago Dental Midwinter Meeting said about the social media plan was to think about, you know, what your goals are, what is it that you're trying to accomplish, and de dentists are all trying to accomplish different things by using social media. They may not know it. But we get to see that. Um, in fact, I just wrote an article about what kind of social media dog are you Be <laughs> using dogs as an analogy for the different ways to use social media. And, um, you know, you have practices that are just getting established and trying to understand how they can leverage the tool, what they should be posting, how often. And then you have you know, some superstar practices that are really into some high level marketing and advertising strategies and tactics, and they're using social media differently. So we'll look at what is it they're, they're trying to achieve. And um, then we look at, you know, who's going to manage social media for them? Are they going to manage it internally? Or do they need some external help? And um, then we look at a content strategy for them, because, some people don't necessarily even understand why content matters and how that's going to impact your brand and how that impacts the trust level that you can build with patients. So we'll look at those main components. So what are my homies going to find on your website, RitaZamora.com? If they went there, what are they going to find? They're going to find a blog that goes on and on for years. I've been blogging for many, many years, so they'll get to see what's inside of my head through the blogs that I've written over the years. Um, I think that's really important. It's just like dentists showing patients who they're going to see. I think it's important for people before they engage a consultant or a service to understand what, um, where their perspective comes from, you know, is this the right type of person to help me in my practice? Um, and they'll also get to see where they might be able to find me at speaking engagements um, and get some ideas on resources for other things that might benefit their practice. Well, you know, uh, dentists, one of, one of their biggest, biggest, biggest problems, my dad solved for me on day one, you know, when I got a doctor in dental surgery, uh, he said, congratulations, son, you're a doctor of dentistry, but you don't know shit about anything else. <laughs> and so many of these dentists, you know, I've known them for 30 years, and they sit there and they say, I can't believe I never realized my lease said this, and now I'm forced to move, and, and the, the grocery store is expanding. I'm like, well, dude, you, you should uh, – you should sue your attorney. Who the hell read that for you? And, oh, I didn't. I didn't run it by an attorney. I mean, they, they know everything. It's like really, you signed a, a five year lease and you didn't have an attorney look at. So they they do everything themselves because they're a doctor of everything. I'm a DDS. I'm a doctor of dental surgery, but most of them are DOEs. They're doctors of everything. So they do all their own social media, and and they were trained eight years in math and physics and chemistry, and they just think, well, anybody can do my social media. But you you have a social media manager services. Um, how much better do you think a specialist like you is than a doctor of everything? Mm -hmm. um, generally, we're going to be a lot better at it because <laughs> we worked with many practices all over the country. I can tell you there is no cookie cutter answer to everything because we've run the same ads and had the same program for different practices in different parts of the country and what works for one may not work for the other so there is some strategic noodle throwing to um, to some of this but for the most part we're going to save doctors a ton of time and help them to get a lot further a lot faster than than them doing it themselves it's just a much better use of their time as you know they're they're profit margin per hour um, is best spent doing what they're trained in. I know. I wish every dental office that as soon as the dentist stepped off the rheostat, red flashing lights would start blinking and everybody <laughs> would run, run to the office and tell them to get back on the rheostat. Um, how much is your service and what does it include? What, what do you actually mm -hmm. do? 
It starts at $5.95 per month, and that includes um, Facebook services. That includes a conservative um, Facebook ad budget. Uh, be, and I say conservative because, as you know, some dentists can spend thousands of dollars a month on Facebook ads and they can do very well with it. So um, it depends on where the doctor is, again, the practice on social media and whether or not, um, you know, that particular package at 595 is going to be a good fit for them or not. So we have to talk with them, make sure that um, what we have to offer is in line with their goals and make sure we're the right fit for them first. So for five ninety five a month, does that include, is any of that five ninety five go towards buying Facebook ads? It does, yes. Well, boosts or sponsored post Facebook ads, correct. But some dentists would say, okay, I'll give you five ninety five, but I really want a lot of Facebook boosts and sponsored posts. So some of your clients give you a lot more money than that, right? They may, yes. And they may actually be beyond what our agency is really um, offering. So if they're looking to do something that's in the thousands per month and they have um, a funnel system set up and they've got strategic landing pages, they may be of a different type of social media dog, if you will, um, and if you read this article, you'll understand how un- knowing which type of social media dog you are, knowing which type of needs that you have may or may not be a good fit for our agency. So who is the most likely uh, to want your services? Would it be orthodontist because their average new patient is worth $6,500? Whereas a general dentist, if you look at insurance data, um, the average uh, um, American spent last year, I think it was uh, four. Uh, I, th- I think it was three eighty five, which uh, so 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 do orthodontists more likely uh, to be more aggressive on this social media marketing because their revenue per new patient so much higher. They do, and actually, the orthodontists that I visited with um, through my speaking engagements over the years, a lot of them have hired someone internally that can really work as a PR person, a social media person, and might handle some other marketing. So many oral surgeons are so progressive that they've actually got it dialed in internally. So we mainly work with general practices. We work with quite a few oral surgeons, actually. Really? And um, yeah, and also we work with some dental corporate clients as well. We have different, uh, we work with a magazine with Do um, Dental entrepreneur women's magazine. I'm sure you know Ann Duffy. Um, so we work with other more corporate type of clients as well. Nice. And, and when you meet these clients, when you meet General Dennis, what would you say is uh, that when you, when you meet them, what, what do you think they're struggling with the most in social media? Mm-hmm. Gosh, I would say that um, they all have different, different challenges depending on where they're at in um, in social media, and some of them are just getting started. Some of them are just trying to understand what social media is and how it can benefit their practice. Um, you're obviously very familiar, and I would say at expert level <laughs> with social media, but there are a lot of doctors out there, even millennial doctors, who may not necessarily understand what they need to do to attract um, patients that are of a different age than them that might be more mature or spending time with tools like Facebook that they may not be as familiar with. So they're all struggling with, um, with different things. When oral surgeons come to you, are they looking for young millennials to pull their wisdom teeth or are they looking for grandma and grandpa to place implants? Because mm-hmm. some people wonder, I mean, I get it, if my four boys are on social media, but I know my mom isn't. And I, I don't know many grandmas and grandpas uh, on Facebook. Is that changing? Because if you're really an oral surgeon and you want a bunch of um, fixed removable implants, I mean, you, you need grandma and grandpa. Is that really an effective medium to get senior citizens? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. And uh, in fact, I thought you might ask that. So I have my statistic here. Um, 60... Two percent of online adults ages 65 um, and older use Facebook, which is a double-digit increase from 
2015 to 2016. So, um, so it, that's it doubled, it 62%, went from, it, 62% of all online adults. So it went from 31 to 62 since 20? That's a, according to Pew Research. Nice. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's really going to run all the kids off Facebook. I, who would want to be on Facebook <laughs> if your grandma was watching your post? Is well, yeah, that's why they've gone somewhere else because they're like, grandma and grandpa are there, the principal's there, you know, teachers are there. So they've definitely gone somewhere else. And even a lot of the younger dentists that I've spoken to and dental students, um, in fact, I just wrote an article about it saying how they say, you know, the F word, um, Facebook, you know, that's just something that they don't necessarily care for or if they have a profile, they don't want anybody to know but I've had quite a few dental students and younger dentists at my talks lately because they want to see how um, we would recommend that um, people use Facebook to attract baby boomer patients so that's uncharted territory for them so for the first time ever we've got um, you know older dentists that might be there or more mature dentists or dentists that are late adopters that are saying we don't really know how to use social media but then now we've got also dental students or millennial dentists saying we don't know necessarily how we should use Facebook to attract baby boomer patients to our practice because we're using Snapchat and Instagram. So it's kind of an interesting time right now. What percent of the marketing budget do you think should be social media as opposed to say, you know, direct mail or, or, or a billboard or, or whatever? I mean, mm -hmm. um, and am I too old school? Um, my dad had Sonic drive-in franchises and he just beat into my brain, location, location, location. When I, when I was a little boy, you know, and he was expanding his Sonics. A lot of times Saturday morning, he'd get me up at like, oh gosh, you know, real early in the morning. He'd drop me off at an intersection where there was a lot of land for sale. And he'd say, here's a piece of chalk. When it's a red light, I want you to make a hash mark where the last car was. Because I want to know if the car's coming the other direction, can turn in, blah, blah. But I mean, it, just, it, was, just, it was just all <laughs> location, location, location. So when I set up my office, I, I bought the land, built the building, a 4,000 square foot building on a four lane intersection with my big sign, today's dental, lit on two sides of the building, monument side. Um, do you still think um, location, 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 or do you think that you're, um, if you were talking to a 25-year-old kid that just walked out of school and said, would you say with social media, it wouldn't even matter if you're in a medical dental building and had no visibility from the street, or do you still think mm -hmm. visibility from the street is imperative? Um, talk, talk about location, location, location versus social media um, besides all the other stuff like direct mail. And I'd, I wouldn't have to have a billboard because my intersection has like 30,000 cars go through it a day. That's everybody, right. in, everybody in Ahwatukee. I'll never mm -hmm. meet anyone in Ahwatukee where I'll say, well, do you know where Safeway is? Yeah. You yeah. know how Chase is on the corner? Yeah. That building there right next to that? Have you ever seen that building? Yeah. What is that? Is, isn't it a dental office? And they don't even, they don't even know I'm a dentist or I'm, they, they know. So, so talk about that. That was a lot of ranting. Right. Yeah, no, it's good. I mean, I like them both. So I think ideally you could have both. You'd want to have that great location and good social media. I mean, you can have awesome visibility and have a great location. And the marketing person in me loves that because you're going to spend that money once on your location, right? Maybe you own the building or whatever, and then that's your asset forever and you're in a great location. So that's great for a number of reasons. But if you're in that great location and you don't have a good presence on social media, people can't actually see who you are and they're not seeing things that they can connect with or you're not using social media well, then that good location is not going to benefit you as well as it would have back in the day when that was the only thing that people would use to um, decide if you're going to be a good choice for them anymore. So you still have to have social media um, it still is something and it's going to become increasingly important for people to see who you are and what they can expect when they come into your practice. And so many dentists um, don't get that yet. They don't understand how important having even current photos. I tell people when you come to my program, like the most important thing is to have current photos. Like if you have that Olin Mills background and those poses and I mean you probably know <laughs> what I'm talking about you know I mean get rid of those because that immediately dates you and 
that's an advantage that, again, some of the dental students that come to my program lately are saying, we're already getting online reviews from patients. I guess there's a portion of your practice that allows you um, to start getting or a portion of your education near the latter years where you can start um, treating patients and they're getting those reviews. So they're entering the workplace with a great um, reputation and that's going to impact more mature dentists when they're competing with younger dentists that have a better online reputation because they've been more comfortable and more aggressive about it. Um, and speaking of online reputation, I just went on Dental Town uh, for the show, and I did a search for Rita Zamora, and you uh, several <laughs> several threads pop up, and uh, you have raving raving fans on Dental Town. Um, and, but oh. but when I but when I go to um, but when I l- watch Dennis on Dental Town, um, and and uh, download the app today, it's free in the iTunes Store from Google Play. But um, you can do a search for anything, but. When, when you watch them talk about social media, I swear to God, they have a, a brain explosion when they get a bad review. I mean, they want to they wanna get a lawyer. They want to go nuclear. They, they, they're just beside themselves. Whereas I am the other side of the deal where I realize there's seven and a half billion wild monkeys uh, trapped on the surface of the earth. And I think at least 20% of all humans on earth are completely batshit crazy. <laughs> and, um, and I just, I say, if you stir poop, it makes it stink. I, I don't care. And, and it's, it's, it's um, but what, 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 how would you talk a dentist back from the ledge uh, when he gets a bad review? Mm-hmm. How, what, what do you do when there's a uh, bad review? Do you answer yeah. and reply or do you just let it go? Uh, well, the whole answer it and reply thing, I mean, we could spend like a whole show or two on that. And, you know, and some, I've even had debates and some of my talks where dentists are like, we've hired an attorney and here's what our attorney says. And then someone else will say, this is what our attorney says. And then they both kind of go at it. And I'm like, at the end of the day, there might even be different attorneys with different opinions and you have to find one that you're comfortable with. So you know, you do have to put this into perspective. And if you get a a poor review about, you know, I tried to call you over the lunch hour and it took 12 rings or whatever versus I recently dealt with a practice that had a drug seeker that was harassing the practice and he left all kinds, like 17 different um, reviews on Google and, and started leaving them on Facebook. And that's the thing I love about Facebook too, is they really put the kibosh on this account because it was a fake pro, you know, obviously a fake profile that was out to do damage. And they just removed the reviews like overnight, which was great. Um, And so, you know, it just depends on what is the situation. And I could never say like, you know, don't get angry and don't get upset about this because everybody is a different person. So Um, You just have to look at each individual situation and my overall advice with people I've been talking about um, at my presentations is to put together a social media crisis plan. (laughs) You may never have to use it. Nine times out of 10, you're probably not going to have to use it, but it helps you to at least feel confident you would know what to do if that situation ever comes up. And it's as basic as, you know, who's responsible in the practice for responding to the negative review Uh, If it's really major, do you have an attorney or a risk management expert or a dental consultant that you can call if it's popped up on Saturday at midnight and you're freaking out? Who are you going to call? And then understanding how you can respond to these negative reviews, keeping in mind HIPAA is most important and planning out your response. I mean, this is what banks and airlines and cable companies do. They spend thousands of dollars on these war room situations or scenarios where they say, give it to me, like give me the worst that you got. I wanna hear it. And um, they plan what their responses are gonna be based on their legal guidelines and blah, blah, blah. So anyhow. Knowing what to do in that situation helps everybody to sleep better at night. Sometimes when we get one um, in the morning huddle, someone will say, by the way, someone yesterday wrote a review, blah, 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 blah. And usually someone in the office goes, oh, my God, I know exactly who that was. That was, that was Frank. I'll, I'll go call him right now. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and so usually um, the, the guy just will take him down and, and come in. That, that, that's all we do. 
and uh, and if it's uh, complaint. But what what I what I hate about the bad review is when someone comes in and they just want to talk to the doctor, and I sit there and I'll look at I'll be in the operatory. And I'll talk to him for an hour, and then it turns out they, uh, you know, they don't want to pay money. They don't have insurance. They just want me to do all this, and then they don't want to pay me for, you know, thirty days. And, and I'll waste an hour and a half with them, and I'll just say no, and then they'll leave and write a bad review. It's like, my God, you just come in, took an hour and a half of my life, and and then you're insane, and then you left a bad review. I want to ask you another uh, controversial mm-hmm. question. Um, when you um, talk about social media on Dental Town. My God, every thread on y- regarding Yelp is den- – dentists have uh, – <laughs> I, mean, I mean, really, I mean, no one's ever uh, – I've never heard anything controversial about reviews on Facebook or Google. But my God, when you start l- reading those threads on Yelp, it's, uh, uh, it, it's extremely what, – what, why is what, – do you agree with that or disagree? Yeah, well, I'm just seeing the emoji right now that's like, oh, uh, you know. Um, and I can tell you again, for the fortunate position that I'm in is that I get to hear from dentists when I do my presentations all over the country. Um, and generally, there's a love-hate relationship with Yelp. I mean, there are pockets of areas in the country where Yelp is really popular, and it obviously shows up high on a Google search, and it can benefit doctors who have a good um you know, a good reputation on Yelp. However, yes, I mean, there's those dentists that say, you know, I feel like they're out to blackmail us. And because when you're paying advertising dollars, the bad reviews are filtered, and then you stop advertising, and they show up again, and blah, blah, blah. So there's all of that controversy. And I usually try and you know, keep things at bay so we don't have a Yelp witch hunt. And, um, you know, it is what it is. And I think people know that Yelp's business model is the way it is. And that's why, again, I think Facebook is so beneficial because you can scroll over people's profiles and see these are real, you know, individuals. You could see lots of information about who they are and what they do and maybe where they live and where they work depending on how private or open they are and that's another big benefit to having a good solid social media presence is even if you get a crazy person that sprouts up and writes something negative people are going to go and look and say oh this Howard guy he's a pretty good guy actually look how cool he is and you know it just really can help you to protect your online reputation as well. Well, I um, was really excited to see, you know, uh, Amazon made a lot of money for a lot of years because they patented that one-click shopping deal. So you didn't have to re-enter your credit card and all that stuff. You see it, one-click, it's done. And now they just patented uh, the one-click video review. And I'm going to like that a lot better because, like, I'm sitting there thinking of, the you know, the Ferran family Thanksgiving dinner. I mean, if, if you said something or Ryan said something, that would mean something totally different than a couple of my crazy aunts saying it. And so on that one click video, I mean, that review, if you can see that person saying the review, that the, the context would be totally different. I mean, you can spot right. crazy on a yeah. video. So it'd be one thing if the person was matter of fact and talking and explaining versus mm-hmm. somebody with crazy eyes and going crazy. So I, I think the, the um, I, I think the uh, one-click uh, Amazon review or going to video reviews. I mean, I, I just to me personally, a video review means a thousand times more than a text review because the text review, I don't know who you are. Um, you mm-hmm. talked about Facebook ads. Um, what about Google ads and YouTube? That's mm-hmm. social media too. Are you, are you all in Facebook ads? Do you do Google ads? What And what, what's, the, what's the difference in your amazing social media mind between a Facebook ad and a Google ad? Yeah, we actually don't touch Google ads. Um, I recommend if people want to do advertising with Google AdWords that they work with someone who's super experienced or is a Google AdWords certified specialist because it's a totally different science. It's a totally different um, type of advertising and you can blow a lot of money really quick um, on Google AdWords. If you don't know what you're doing, it can be, you know, very, very bad. Would, so, would you say Google AdWords what? 
Google. A Google AdWords certified specialist. There's actually a test that you can take to become certified in Google AdWords. Um, and I know there's a lot of good agencies out there that aren't necessarily certified, but they're so experienced um, with Google AdWords that they know what they're doing. Um, that, um, you know, it's just really important that you work with someone who has a lot of experience with it or is certified because it's a totally different animal. So we so, don't, so basically what we don't you're, do ads. On so basically what Google. you're saying is if you're going to do Google AdWords, you really got to be technically sophisticated, fancy, or work with a Google AdWord certified specialist, but you really don't need to be that smancy fancy to do Facebook ads. It's just a different, it's a different science. It's a different tool. So um, Facebook changes every day. There's a new enhancement. There's a new option. There's all sorts of new things to take advantage of. And I think the thing that really drew me to Facebook initially and that continues to intrigue me about Facebook is that it's really all modeled off of social norms. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is really put the dentist or the specialist in their best light and put them in front of the patients that are going to be their ideal patients. And leveraging that with Facebook is a way that really makes us feel good about what we're able to do for the dentist or the specialist or our other clients. And we don't have that same option to leverage that authenticity um, and trust building with, you know, Google AdWords, um, YouTube ads. It's the same thing. It's an, it's a totally different animal. So that's why social media has really become our wheelhouse. We don't do website design and development. We don't do, you know, SEO for the website. It's really all social media. So do you, uh, but back to, uh, back to this, you know, I, I'm a hardcore believer in location, 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 good signage on intersection and, 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 and especially, uh, you know, it's, it's an appreciating asset. Um, you're really big into social media. Do you think there's still any, uh, we uh, both agree that yellow pages is pretty much uh, gone the way of the T-Rex, but do you think there's still any place for direct mail and postcards? I think there is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, again, I would say it just depends on your practice, on your area. I, I just spoke to a practice recently, and they're in a very rural area, and um, they're looking at buying the only billboard space that's available at the main entry in and out of their town. I'm like, go for it. I mean, why wouldn't you again? It's like, you know, um, that makes total sense for them. So I think you have to really look at each individual practice and what's going to make the most sense for them. There's so many different marketing tools and options. I mean, one of the things that I do at my programs is show people um, just a basic marketing plan in a visual format. And a lot of people take pictures of it because they think they don't even really understand how to get all those pieces they have flying in their head into an orderly, you know, visual that they can see. And it's making sure all your internal marketing is, you know, really dialed in first, even before you start going to town on social media. And things, again, I think that you probably know, Howard, but a lot of other um, dentists or people that don't have that business savvy may not really understand that you've got to get that foundation in place first before you start spending money on all these different marketing options. Rita, um, I've been um, I've been seeing more and more millennials. I mean, young dentists, uh, twenty five to thirty, uh, who say who um, skip the website. They say, "Well, you, you don't need a www website. I, I just have a Facebook page." And I'm like, "Seriously, dude, you, you you're not going to do a website?" And they, they go, "No." What would you say to a young kid who started a practice says, "No, I'm just going to have a Facebook page." You don't need a website. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? And I, I, how many times have we met a dentist that have done that on their own? Oh, yeah, especially, Ryan's so correct, especially in Asia, Africa, and South America. But, it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's here in the United States, and it's rampant in Asia, Africa, and South America. Would you say yeah. um, that's a good idea or, or not? Well, I think, you know, I think it's really cool if they can be successful without a website, then more power to them. Um, I have been saying for the last few years that I think 
websites, I mean, websites, as you know, they can be very costly for a dentist with, and there's a lot of dentists that have um, had, you know, not great experiences pouring money into SEO and trying to beat that whole Google game. And I think with social media, you can move from a Google economy where people are going to search for things to a discovery economy where people are discovering you through their use of social media, whether it be Instagram or what have you. And so right now, I think people still expect legitimate I shouldn't say legitimate, but they still would expect a dental practice to have a website. Um, but I think that could change. And we've also got things that are in the mix with, um, you know, Facebook looking to keep people in the walled garden of Facebook as long as possible. So Facebook has added options like services tabs and they've got new options with the messenger and the chat bot, you know, different options that are evolving. So I think that the need for a website will continue to lessen as time goes on. And I don't know if that's going to be two years or five or 10 years, but I, for one, would be really happy if I didn't have to maintain an expensive website and pay for SEO and all that jazz. So if someone asks you uh, for a website referral, is there anyone you, you refer more than others or you have your go-to on that? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I've actually been very careful about who I refer to over the years, because as you know, Howard, sometimes website companies have, you know, come and gone and, people from outside industries come in and are like, Oh, these dentists have money to spend and this is a great market. And then, and then they're gone in a few years. So I've been very careful about who I refer to. And, um, you know, over the years, people that I trust and that I refer to actually my buddy here in Denver, Jeff Gladnick, I think you've interviewed him. His dad's a dentist of great dental websites Jeff Gladnick, um, his dad's a dentist, like many of his family members are dentists. He's got a similar value system to my um, to my business, and he's just a smart, great guy, very ethical. So Great Dental Websites is one. I've also referred um, over the years to Jameson. Uh, I'm sure you know Kathy Jameson, Jameson Marketing um, and Management. Ka Carrie Weber is Kathy Jameson's daughter, and she's the... Um, the face of the company now, one of the faces, her and Jess Weber, they're good people. They do a great job. And um, we have another company or two that we refer to on occasion. But for the most part, I really look at referring to people that I know um, have a similar value system to ours. Yeah. And um, Jeff Gladnick uh, won the uh, Tony Choice Award this year. On uh, the, yeah. And, and uh, so you guys might not know about that, but um, every year since uh, the beginning, 1998, we have all the townies vote on their favorite company in each category. And it's just amazing, um, you know, because everybody voting is, is, is a doctor. And uh, my God, it's not like the People's Choice Award where everybody voting could be anybody. I mean, th these are all doctors who bought these products and services with their own money. And I remember mm -hmm. looking at these lists with uh, Gordon Christian before, and he says, you know, market data is so significant when your group of people um, have, you know, eight to 12 years of college. And it's just mm -hmm. amazing how they just nail the best of the best. So if, if you're, if you're not sure on your, what I, what I say is this, if you're not having any problem with your composites or you don't, but you don't, you don't have any problem, don't change it. You have so many problems to fix, never fix anything that ain't broke. But let's just say on your denture reline material, you know, you're just having problems. It's setting up. It's flaking off. Go to Dental Town. Go to the Townie Choice Ward and see who did all the dentists vote for their favorite denture reline material. I mean, you know what works and doesn't work if you're doing it all day long. But it's it's usually those materials and services that you hardly ever used, and your homies took the time to vote. And uh, yeah, Jeff Gladneck uh, did that. <laughs> Um, so what, what, um, what else, um, um, my, my big question is this, I think everybody knows what Facebook is, but I guarantee you a lot of people still haven't, um, figured out Instagram or haven't looked at like all my drinking buddies. None of them are on Instagram. Uh, you know, we're all 55, <laughs> we're all grandkids or kids are raised. There isn't one of them that knows that's ever seen Instagram or Snapchat, but, but just go back to Instagram. If you were talking 
if you were drinking with my buddies and they said, Rita, what, what is Instagram and how is it different mm-hmm. than Facebook? What, what would you say to them? Yeah, I would say that Instagram is what Facebook was when Facebook pages first got released in that it's an, it's an easier place to go and get that organic visibility and, um, and start to utilize the tool more organically before Facebook, you know, got too crowded. So I think what really drew a lot of people to Instagram this past year was the politics, uh, you know, the political stuff that was going on. People were just like over it on Facebook. So they, you know, going on Instagram, it's pictures and short videos and you can see all kinds of, you know, cool things without having all of that riffraff there. So Um, It was a great escape for people. But dentists, I think um, there are a whole population of dentists that are very active on Instagram and they don't touch Facebook because Instagram is incredibly successful for them. And um, if people want an example of a more mainstream, a great Instagram account they can check out, they should look at Royal Oaks Dental. Um, That is um, my friend, Dr. Larry Doherty in um, Texas does a great job. There's also, have you interviewed Brian Bollywaz, Dr. Bollywaz in California, in San Francisco? You You might want to, B-A-L-I-W-A-S. And I think his Instagram handle is at um, SF Dental Nerd, N-E-R-D, which you gotta love, SF, like San Francisco Dental Nerd. So he's got all kinds of, he motivates me to floss every day. And do you you think I should podcast him? Oh, for sure. Well, yeah. Well, what, because, can you send him an email and CC me? Yeah, for sure. He came to one of my talks at the CDA San Francisco meeting last summer and was Instagramming some of my slides and and things. And he's doing some cool things with social media. He says he gets a couple of patients a month just with the social media that he's doing. Um, so, you know, there's lots of cool things that you could be doing on Instagram. But most importantly, using your hashtag with your local city or neighborhood that helps people to find you. Um, That's really important. And again, pictures, people want to see unique, um, nice pictures of your practice of your team or short videos and just hopping on Instagram and following local people. So the same things that we used to do with Facebook, but now you have the opportunity to do it on Instagram and what's going to happen with Instagram moving forward is that you're also going to see people having to pay for visibility just like you do on Facebook now when Instagram gets crowded. So get on there, get on board early. So when do you think they're going to do that? I mean, obviously, I mean, I mean, I, I thought Facebook was the ultimate bait and switch. I mean, when Facebook started in 2004, you were all motivated to build up your community. And then as soon as your community got real big and Facebook got big, they said, Oh, wait a minute. Um, we're only going to push out about 6% of your posts. You got to boost the posts, pay to play. So it was all right. build your own community. And now it's like, now pay us money to reach your own community. When do you think mm-hmm. they're going to do that to Instagram? Do you, is that your 2018 prediction or do you think? I don't know if it's going to happen in 2018. I think it just depends on how quickly, you know, it continues to get more crowded. But I, I don't see having to pay Facebook for that visibility as a bad thing because, you know, people were feeling like they had to post every day on Facebook. And now I tell people, you may only post on Facebook a couple of times a month and you can boost it and get far greater visibility than you did, you know, years ago when it was free. So, you know, and and it's still relatively inexpensive to boost on Facebook and keep a good presence when you compare that to what it cost you for your white page listing years ago, I mean, that was like hundreds of dollars just so people could find your phone number. So, you know, that's crazy. You know, at least now you're able to show people a little bit about who you are and start to build that trust with them. And you're getting a lot more than just letting them see your phone number. So how does it work with you? Cause I, I know Dennis, they, they, they always, before they buy, they always want to talk because they always have something special. If someone's listening to you right now and say, yeah, but Rita, you don't understand. I'm in the middle of Parsons, Kansas, and I mostly want to do implants on elder, blah, blah, whatever it is. How do, how do they contact you uh, to see if you guys are a good fit? 
They can um, reach out to me through a contact form on my website or they can give us a call. Um, and then what I usually do is um, send people a link uh, for my acuity scheduling so they can just look at my calendar online and find a time for us to talk that's convenient for them. And we have a conversation. I can show them some samples of other clients that we work with so they can have a look at their social media presence and see if they like what they see and um, decide if it's going to be a good fit for them or not. We have usually a six month um, period that we ask people to stay with us and then after that it's month to month. So if they feel like their team can take the baton of the systems that we've set up, then a more power to them. I encourage them to do that. We want to do whatever's in the best interest of their practice. Just to set expectations. I mean, basically here's, here's how my homies think. They say, look, Rita, I already pay my rent, mortgage, equipment, bill, that computer, insurance, malpractice, staff, FICA. Mm -hmm. I, I already pay all my bills. If I had 10 more new patients a month, it'd be nothing but net. When someone calls you up and just says, look, Rita, um, I just want 10 more new patients a month. How doable is that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean how, how, how doable? I mean, can, can, can someone really just do, the, do your program and get 10 more new patients a month? Or is, it, or is that just way overly simplified? That's way overly simplified. Um, thank you for saying that because I can tell you we have worked with a client before that said they got a new patient from one picture that they posted on Facebook that the patient connected with and said, you know, I like the fact that your um, practice is a father-daughter practice and that's why I became a patient. And there are practices that we talk with that get multiple patients every month from social media and other practices, it may take months. I mean, it just really depends. And there's a lot of other factors that come into play. Um, you know, So certainly someone that's looking for 10 new patients a month next month from their social media efforts is probably not gonna be our ideal client because the people that we're working with understand that they need to use social media not just to um, get new patients as a direct marketing advertising tool, but they're looking to really build trust with patients, expand their visibility, build a strong online reputation. So there's a lot of other benefits to using social media rather than thinking, I'm going to put this one thing out there and then it's going to get me new patients. It just doesn't work like that generally unless you're doing advertising that's in the direct advertising type of um, mode where people can expect to get direct results from their advertising. Do you know the best social media strategy of all time, the number one winner of all time, what to do? This is what I advise my clients. Go to Africa. Share us. Go to Africa <laughs> and shoot a lion. Oh God. That guy shot Cecil the lion. His website exploded. He got more publicity in a day than all the other dentists in America did in the last year. <sighs> do, you think, yeah. do you think since the lion's already been shot that this time you should do like a giraffe or a penguin or mm. go to Antarctica? How do you do know? Like I'm a major <laughs> I animal. Know, lover. I, That's know, just I like, know, I know, I know. I'm just rasping. Um, um, and again, but you know what as I, like, I mentioned, but you know what I like? I do want to well, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, I do want to say with that said, there, there are lots of different ways to do social media well. So just because, you know, some people are opposed to hunting, I have to say there are pockets of areas where being a hunter is cool and for a practice to be able to do that and show that off, whether it be any kind of belief that they have or a lifestyle or whatever, it can be okay. You just have to be okay knowing that you're going to isolate a bunch of people potentially, and it might be potentially very controversial. On the other hand, you might end up attracting your ideal client. And that's really what we have to do with social media. And um, when people look at my social media, they may be like, oh, she's, you know, having a margarita on the deck at three o'clock in the afternoon. I'm not into that. Or, if they don't like animals or dogs, they maybe are not going to be that attracted to my social media because I have my dog in a lot of pictures. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of my thing. So I think I used to tell people, like, don't post bloody pictures of, like, surgeries and stuff like that on Facebook. But the plastic surgeons are doing live surgeries on Snapchat and Instagram and posting it on Facebook. And wow. they're getting 
patients from it. Um, so there's also oral, an oral surgeon at the face doc in Florida, and he's doing live surgeries on social media. And some people are into that. So I would say, you know, I never say never and never say, you know, don't do that ever because there's a place for almost everything, knowing that you're going to have some risks involved with that. My prediction with Instagram is um, they're going to leave that completely alone until Snapchat stock goes to zero. I mean, I, I think they're going to wait till Snapchat dies. I mean, Twitter and Snapchat are dying on the New York Stock Exchange or the, the, NY, the NASDAQ. I think as soon as those guys um, die, it'll be over. But I was wondering, um, you know, everybody talks about Fang. They talk about uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Google. Uh, but the other one is Microsoft. And what I like about Microsoft is the last bubble, because I think all these stocks are in bubble territory, but the last bubble that popped was March of 2000. And who was those companies? It was Microsoft back then, along with Intel and Cisco and, um, and uh, uh, Dell. And then, uh, and then when I was little, when I was in school, uh, freshman in college in 1980, it was the Nifty 50, and it was Kodak and Xerox and all those. But Microsoft has been in the top of the last two bubbles, and Microsoft just bought LinkedIn. So do you think, do you think now mm -hmm. that Microsoft bought LinkedIn that that might be a, a different animal a year from now? Oh my gosh, I think, I think, you know, I don't know about how Microsoft is going to influence LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is also from a B2B standpoint, as you know, Howard, I mean, it's a great opportunity for you, for Dentaltown, for me, for other more corporate um, B2B businesses is a huge opportunity because they are just starting to add some of those features like video company pages um, have a lot of opportunity. So there's tons of opportunity there. And I think um, LinkedIn's been very careful about the growth that they're making. And I think they have nowhere to go but up from here. So I'm very hopeful about LinkedIn. I love it. It's a great tool. Um, not necessarily so much for dentists, potentially, but I think, you know, so many people want to get on and sell and connect to dentists. That's the downside for them. But very hopeful about LinkedIn, too. Man, I can't believe we already went over an hour. We're already an hour <sighs> over time. They're sitting in their parking lot saying, would you two shut up so I can turn off my car and go <laughs> into work? But I got to ask, can I ask you an overtime question? Sure. They're still asking about um, Angie's list. Is that is that is that uh, relevant? What, 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 co what goes through your mind when someone says Angie's list? The first thing that went into my mind was, oh, my gosh, I haven't heard about Angie's List in a long time. So um, there may be pockets of Angie's List lovers out there. I don't know, but I personally am not that familiar with it. I see where Angie's List was a place where people could go and get local recommendations and things but we get a lot of that on Facebook now like do you belong to like your zip codes Facebook group like my neighborhood has our own Facebook group we police our neighborhood there we get recommendations for different um, vendors whether someone needs a tile person or did you know who had a good tree trimmer or whatever and so that's kind of I think a free easy way for you to get that type of recommendation, you know, also to whether you need a new dentist and who they would recommend. I see that a lot in the Facebook group too. And I think that's free and people trust their neighbors. They can see who they're interacting with, where they're already spending their time on Facebook anyway. So that's my two cents. My personal favorite of Facebook marketing, I think is this. I mean, most of the research I see, well, what, what percent of Americans do you think currently don't have a dentist? What would you guess, Rita? Oh my gosh. I don't know. I, mean, I, I don't I, even know where I, to start. I routinely see numbers that are between 40 and 50% of America don't have a dentist. And so you, the average person probably has 100 plus friends on Facebook. And when you don't have a dentist and you see your smart friend checking in at today's dental, and, you're, and then you're like, oh my God. Rita just checked in at ABC Dental. Then she's going to text you and say, hey, is she a good dentist? And I, I, I think um, I think that... Um, you know, like these hygienists will uh, just give the patient a, a, a free $1 toothbrush uh, for nothing. I say, 
don't give them a damn free toothbrush until they check in on Facebook and, <laughs> or Instagram. Or you yeah, know, and you keep you. saying Instagram. Yeah, um, that's yeah. a. Uh, and I've seen a lot of um, research articles from uh, uh, Professor Galloway at NYU Stern and the uh, Stanford School of Management and the Harvard School of Management saying that um, they uh, a lot of data shows that Instagram is more effective than Facebook. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just a, it's a different tool, and um, I think. Like I said, it's kind of like Facebook was back in the day when you could get all that great organic visibility. It's still fun. There's not a lot of politics and negativity there. So um, we'll see. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk, um, who I'm sure you've heard of, said back in the day that the marketers are going to ruin every social media. You know, we're the cause of pre-scheduling on Facebook and now people have to pay. And when that rolls out on Instagram, the same thing will happen there, I'm sure. But What I think is the funniest, so if you're listening to this and you're in dental school, uh, I always tell my homies, uh, email me, howard at dentaltown.com. Tell me your name, what country you're from, how old you are. Probably 25% uh, are still in dental school and the rest are all under 30. I only get one email a month. Some guy says, dude, I'm as old as you. Um, they're all young, but the one thing I want to leave your note on is when I walked out of dental school, I had never seen a computer. I had never seen a cell phone. Uh, I, it's so exciting to live decade after decade and be 55 because you never saw any of this coming. I remember, I can still remember walking into West National West Bank of Wichita Bank with my old man, and they had just installed an ATM machine. And we walked up, and we were watching this guy with this, and my dad and I looked at each other like, who the hell would use an ATM machine when you could walk in there, <laughs> and Lorraine will do it. And we walked in there, and we know Lorraine. Hi, Lorraine. And she did all her baking. We come out. That man was still uh, trying to do this ATM machine. My dad and I looked at each other and laughed and said, that'll never take <laughs> off. Uh, I remember when I saw the first cell phone. It was a brick attached to a briefcase. And I said, yeah, you know, why wouldn't you just take a dime and go to the payphone at every gas station <laughs> in America? But uh, so what I always wonder is I'm 55. God only knows what will be here at 65. I mean, we might not even we might because we've lived through Friendster. I mean, there, there's going to be some next big thing and you'll never see it coming. And it'll just it'll just come out of nowhere. It always does. Yeah. 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 But I do think, uh, you know, authenticity and trust moving forward is the way as we get more and more things available to us, it's it's harder and harder to make decisions. We live in an abundant world and having that trust and being able to, you know, connect with someone is what's going to help us make, you know, make those important connections in this busy world that we have. So last and final question has nothing to do with dentistry. Uh, you should never talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence, especially on social media. But um, your state is famous for legalizing marijuana. My state, Arizona, is famous <laughs> as the only one, the only state in the last election that did not legalize it. Um, a lot of people in Arizona um, are very, you, you've lived through the legalization of marijuana mm -hmm. in um, Colorado. Was it an issue, non-issue? No. What, what would you tell the great people of Arizona? I would say that it's been great for our economy. Um, it's been awesome for our economy. Um, there have been some downsides to it as well. We definitely have noticed a um, an influx of, you know, wanderers, if you will, in the nicer weather months that kind of come through and kind of camp out and, and hang out. However, because we were one of the first states to legalize, I think we may have had that bigger advantage to our economy and might have had that bigger influx of wanderers. So other states now, as they come on board with that, might start to might might have less of a boom in their economy than Colorado did because we were first, um, you know, but hopefully they would take some of our wanderers out of our state. So you're in um, Boulder, Colorado, right? We're just outside of Boulder, actually, in Louisville, which so, a lot of people haven't heard about. So but. What, what's the big football stadium in Boulder? Is it CU? CU. University mm -hmm. of Colorado? Yes, That the is Buffaloes. the most romantic city Buffs. for me ever, Ryan. I don't know if I ever told you a story, but it was <sighs> freshman year. My uh, two roommates are now dentists. It was Gary Isoldi, who practices in Hawthorne, New Jersey, and Randy Kerwin, who practices in uh, uh, rural Kansas. 
And we were studying and trying to make A's and all that, but the Rolling Stones went on tour, and, and the closest they got to us was Boulder, and Hart opened up for them, and we packed in the car. We finished classes, jumped in the car, and drove all through the night, all the way from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, to Boulder, Colorado, and back then in that stadium, you know, it was three young 18-year-old guys, so we just kind of bullied and pushed, <laughs> probably got to within 10 feet of the front of stage and watched Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones, and I swear to God, that had to be one of the top 10 greatest days of my life, and uh, my gosh, that was so fun, And uh, but Rita, this show is only a success is because I'm able to get on amazing people like you. Thank you so much for Thank giving you. me an hour of your life to come on my show and talk to my homies. I'm sure they all enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Howard. Appreciate you. Have a rockin' hot day.